We heard it in other forms. And who are, who are these, these? Where are the different countries? I can show you Africa. This is Africa. 10% of the world population, most in poverty. This is OECD, the rich country, the country club of the UN. And they are over here on this side, and quite an overlap between Africa and OECD. And this is Latin America. It has everything on this earth, from the poorest to the richest in Latin America. And on top of that, we can put East Europe, we can put East Asia, and we could South Asia. And how did it look like if we go back in time to about 1970? Then there was more of a hump. Huh? And we have most who lived in absolute poverty were Asians. The problem in the world was the poverty in Asia. And if I now let the world move forward, you will see that while population increase, there are hundreds of millions in Asia getting out of poverty, and some others get into poverty. And this is the pattern we have today, and the best projection from the World Bank is that this will happen. And we will not have a divided world, we will have most people in the middle. Of course it's a logarithmic scale here, but our concept of economy is growth with percent. We look upon it as a possibility of percental increase. If I change this and I take GDP per capita instead of family income and I turn these uh, individual data into regional data of gross domestic product and I take the regions down here, the size of the bubble is still the population and you have the OECD there and you have Sub-Saharan Africa there and we take off the Arab states there coming both from Africa and from Asia and we put them separately and we can expand this axis and I can give it a new dimension here by adding uh, the social values there, child survival. Now I have money on that axis and I have the possibility of children to survive there. In some countries, 99.7% of children survive to five years of age, others only 70. And here it seems that there is a gap between OECD, Latin America, East Europe, East Asia, Arab states, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. The linearity is very strong between child survival and money. But let me split Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, health is there and better uh, health is up there. I can go here and I can split Sub-Saharan Africa into its countries. And when it bursts, the size of East country bubble is the size of the population. Sierra Leone down there, Mauritius up there. Mauritius was the first country to get away with trade barriers and they could sell their sugar, they could sell their textiles on equal terms as the people in Europe and North America. There's a huge difference between Africa and Ghana is here in the middle. In Sierra Leone, humanitarian aid. Here in uh, Uganda, development aid. Here, time to invest. There you can go for holiday. It's a tremendous variation within Africa, which we very often make that it's equal everything. I can split South Asia here. India is the big bubble in the middle, but huge difference between Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. And I can split Arab states. How are they? Same climate, same culture, same religion, huge difference. Even between neighbors, Yemen, civil war, United Arab Emirates money, which was quite equally and well used. Not as the myth is. And that includes all the children of the foreign workers who are in the country. Data is often better than you think. Many people say that data is bad. There is an uncertainty margin. But we can see the difference here, Cambodia, Singapore. The differences are much bigger than the weakness of the data. East Europe, Soviet economy for a long time, but they come out after 10 years very, very differently. And there is Latin America. Today we don't have to go to Cuba to find a healthy country in Latin America. Chile will have a lower child mortality than Cuba within some few years from now. And here we have high income countries in OECD and we get the whole pattern here of the world, which is more or less like, like this. And if we look at it, how it looks the world, in 1960, it starts to move, 1960, this is Mao Zedong, he brought health to China. And then he died, and then Deng Xiaoping came and brought money to China and brought them into the mainstream again. And we have seen how countries move in different directions like this. So it's sort of, sort of difficult to get an example country which shows the pattern of the world. But I would like to bring you back to about here at uh, 1960. Eh? 
And I would like to compare uh, um, South Korea, which is this one, with, with Brazil, which is this one. The label went away for me here. And I would like to compare Uganda, which is there. Huh? And I can run it forward like this. Huh? And you can see how South Korea is making a very, very fast advancement, whereas Brazil is much slower. And if we move back again here, and we put on trails on them like this, you can see again that the speed of development is very, very different. And the countries are moving more or less in the same rate as money and health. But it seems you can move much faster if you are healthy first than if you are wealthy first. And to show that, you can put on the way of United Arab Emirates. They came from here, a mineral country. They catch all the oil, they got all the money, but health cannot be bought at the supermarket. You have to invest in health. You have to get kids into schooling. You have to train health staff. You have to educate the population. And Sheikh Zayed did that in a fairly good way. And in spite of falling oil prices, he brought this country up here. So we got a much more mainstream appearance of the world, where all countries tend to use their money better than they used in the past. Now, this is more or less if you look at, if you look at average data of the countries. They are like this. Now, that's dangerous to use average data because there's such a lot of difference within countries. So if I go and look here, we can see that Uganda, that today is where South Korea was 1960. If I split Uganda, there's quite a difference within Uganda. These are the quintiles of Uganda. The richest 20% of Ugandans are there. The poorest are down there. If I split South Africa, it's like this. And if I go down and look at Niger, where there was such a terrible famine, lastly, it's like this. The 20% poorest of Niger is out here, and the 20% richest of South Africa is there, and yet we tend to discuss on what solutions there should be in Africa. Everything in this world exists in Africa. And you can't discuss universal access to HIV for that quintile up here with the same strategy as down here. The improvement of the world must be highly contextualized. And it's not relevant to have it on regional level. We must be much more detailed. We find that students get very excited when they can use this. And even more policy.